Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Unstoppable. I'm your host, Kerwin Ray, and today we talk all things leadership with Marty Moore, leadership extraordinaire. He has over 30 years of business experience as a CEO across multiple sectors. In fact, he took CS Energy from just 18 million to 444 million dollars. Actually, that was 441 million dollars in just five years. He calls himself the CEO of CEOs with a passion for creating high performance teams and leaders. And today we talk about leaders, culture, and how to maximize the journey and create high performance teams. Listen up. This one's going to hit you where it hurts. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to Unstoppable, the the Unstoppable CEO, CEO himself, Marty Moore. Thank you for coming in, Marty. Pleasure, Kerwin. Great to be here. Now, mate, um, you have quite an illustrious career. Like when I was going through your profile the last couple of days, I was like, wow, this guy's actually done some decent stuff. But for those people who perhaps haven't heard about who Marty Moore is and what you do, what's the 15 second, the highlights reel of you know what, what your pedigree is? Okay, quick quick Harlequin view over the top. I actually started off as an IT guy, believe it or not. I was yeah, a right. software developer. You've got way too much personality for an IT guy. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? There's hope for anyone, <laughs> yeah. right, if I, if I can do that. <laughs> but I started off there, and after a number of years, I figured uh, IT is a lot of fun, but it's not where the action is. Yep. So I decided probably about you know, 17, 18 years ago that I wanted to have a career in business. Okay. So I set about my task – Uh, and my goal of becoming a chief executive of a major business. And that took me on a circuitous route because the path is never the path we think we're going to have. So uh, my first serious executive role was as chief information officer of a mining company in Queensland. And since then, I've been through mining, insurance, transport and logistics, uh, to the point where I ran a large energy business in Queensland as chief executive. It was uh, CS Energy, right? It was CS Energy. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you led quite a big turnaround on that company from from the notes that I've seen. It was a big turnaround, yeah. and I think I think when I walked into the company, and and if any of your listeners are mistaken about this, I just want to set this clear right up front. There's a lot of luck and timing in this CEO caper. <laughs> I, I went in there when the market was really low. like. I, I, let me just challenge everything. Yeah. Luck is there really a lot of luck in it? Well, you know, because you can say that there's luck, luck there's timing, there's, 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 there's outlier yeah. aspects, but when it comes to luck, nobody nobody becomes a great CEO by luck. No, really. well, that's 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 true. But you've yep. got to have certain things in your favour, and I think I yes. think I love the um, the Warren Buffett quote: "When a management team with a reputation for brilliance." tackles a business where the reputation for bad economics, it's the business that's going to have its reputation intact. Yeah, right? Right. There are some there are some six star shitty businesses that you aren't going to be able to turn around. So you've got to be in an industry at the right time. Yep. And I think in terms of timing that's it what happened perfect to me. Timing. I, I, yeah, that's right. I went it's in, quite an incredible turnaround from 18 million to 441 million. Yeah, yeah. So we, we had compound annual growth rate in earnings of about 125%, which is quite rare. Yeah. But it really came down to a couple of really big commercial issues that the company was struggling under that they hadn't been able to solve for a lot of years. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I do is bring a, an extraordinarily strong commercial mindset to what's going on. And of course, unlock the resources in the organization through leadership, which is really what my passion is. So you seem to be a little one of those hybrid leaders from what I've seen so far, where you've got the analytical mind, you come from that IT engineering type background, but you've also got incredible soft skills when it comes to the leadership and um, cultural development and, and you know managing and working with high performance teams. But I'm curious to know what made you choose the CEO route and not the entrepreneur route. Well, I think I'd always had an attraction to big business. I liked um, I liked working in large businesses. My first career job. Um, when I stopped dicking around in the bars of King's Cross, was to actually work for a for a bank. So I worked for uh, the State Bank of New South Wales, as it was at the time, as yeah, right. a software developer. And I loved the concept of the big businesses, the um, the large pool of resources that we use, both financial and human and so forth, and how they brought that together in a very, very complex environment and complex structure to actually get results. And seeing how most organisations do that in such a suboptimal way, particularly the people side of it, has really driven me a lot of those years. Yeah, right. So what is the difference between a good CEO and a shit CEO? Oh, gee, I tell you what, there are a lot of CEOs who look good on the outside, yeah. but once you dig down below the surface, they're not. There are a lot of very talented people, as I said before, a lot of talented CEOs who have strategy and market presence and so forth. But I think the great CEOs are the ones where people come into work each day and when they go home, they say, I had a really good day, I had impact, I made a difference. I can understand where the organization's going. And what I did today made a difference to the purpose of that organization. And a great CEO will have both the vision and the execution skills. And without being a soft, mamby-pamby, fluffy leader, will actually get the best out of people. Yeah, right. 
I think, it, would you agree there's also a challenge depending on the context of being a CEO? Because um, obviously something we see in the public sector in terms of the publicly listed entities versus the privately owned entities, the ones in the public list and entities, there seems to be some CEOs who have a very, very strong reputation for the churn and burn. You know, all they're interested in is the quarterly numbers to make sure that they hit the quarterly projections in order to make sure they're hitting their quarterly bonuses, but they're not really giving a shit about what's going to be happening to the company in the next, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Yes, it's a real problem, isn't it? The short term is. Yeah. And, and I just don't know how that particular problem is going to get solved because everything is geared that way. And look, I was talking to the CEO of a listed company the other day who said to me, Marty, it, they say they want this and they say they want long term vision. They say they want culture change. They say they want everything else. But you try and miss a quarterly projection and see how they punish you. Yeah, right. And they will fly with their capital and they'll leave you. Mm. And so how you get out of that, I don't know. It's driven by a lot by self-interest. And it's also when you look at the average tenure of a CEO, that's a problem as well, because mm. if the average tenure of a CEO in a country is, you know, four or five years, well, they're not going to look beyond that. Yeah. And they won't have the courage to make the really long term decisions. And I think that's a thing that, um, as you coming back to your previous question, Kerwin, differentiates a great CEO. A great mm. CEO looks at the sustainability of the business over a long period of time. Because to me, a great CEO wouldn't be wouldn't worry about their presidential ten- tenure. They'd be worried about the legacy of the company for the next 100 years. Absolutely, absolutely. And look, I don't know um, if it's too early in the interview to bring in sport, because I yeah. love it. Um, but you look at a guy like um, Tom Brady. Now, I, yeah. I love the American football, the NFL. Yeah. And uh, Tom Brady and the New England Patriots have just won their sixth Super Bowl. Wow. And this is in sixth Super Bowl in... Uh, 18 years out of nine appearances. Wow. And it's unprecedented because this whole thing, that market, that that game, that business is designed so that you can't do that, Mm. right? They have a draft, they have salary caps. You're not supposed to be able to do that. And it's this guy who's been able to put his self-interest aside. And the reason I love this story is because Tom was drafted 199th pick or something when he was in 2000, like 1999 out of University of Michigan. He became a great quarterback, and as he got better and better and better, he could have commanded more and more personal salary. But what he decided to do was to sacrifice that so they could put more money into different players. Because oh, he, I didn't because, know this. Yeah, because he figured yeah, it, do, right. it, does, it doesn't matter how well I throw the ball if there's no one on the other end to catch it when yeah. I throw it, right? So they went about hiring better players in different positions to make a stronger team overall. And because of that, oh, what, what oh. seemed like an absence of self-interest is actually long-term thinking. Yeah. So what he's done is to create a complete legacy for himself where he's considered to be the best of all time. Yep. So uh, quite, quite an amazing story. That's and, fucking incredible. Yeah. I actually didn't it know is. that. Yeah. That's inspiring. Well, 2007, um, they wanted to get a wide receiver by the name of Randy Moss. Tom gave up $5 million of his base salary so they could bring Randy, right? And this is this has been going on for years, right? So he, he's only a mediocrely paid quarterback, but he's the best of all time, and he has six Super Bowl rings to show for it. He's going to go down in history. Wow. So this is the long-term thing that yeah. leaves legacy. Now apply that to the business world and see how it goes. Oh, that's fucking magic. Yeah, it's good, isn't that's it? That's absolutely magic. How important is it for business owners themselves who are in the entrepreneurial space to actually get to that point or to aspire to identify as a CEO versus I'm just a business owner? Um, that's interesting because I've come back the other direction, right? So yeah, right. I, I was a CEO of a large business and now I'm back as an entrepreneur. And I think the aspiration to be a CEO, I think it's sort of a bit hollow. Um, the title's irrelevant. doesn't matter, yep. right? Um, for me, it's about what I'm doing now as being the true purpose that I'm put on this planet to live out. That's where I am at the moment. And it's about me being able to bring value to people. And I'm a massive believer in uh, the power of markets. And if I can provide some value that's there for customers, consumers, you know, aspiring leaders, if I can do that, then I'll be rewarded for it. And if I can't, I won't. And that's okay. I'm really comfortable with that concept. But I don't care what people call me. Right? I don't. I don't care. I've, I've got to have. A, I've got to have let, a let me moniker. Right? Let me but create a different frame. It's less about the moniker because this is one of the things that I see. Because um, you know, I think you you play in the very big end of town. I, I'm playing in the small to medium sized end of town. And one of the things that I ask business owners when they get into business, I say, why did you get into business in the first place? And they said, oh, because I wanted to have more freedom. And I'd say, how's that fucking working out for you? <laughs> yeah, totally, exactly. totally. And it jokes on us, right? Absolutely. Nine out of ten times. 
Um, because one of the things that I see is I see that for many entrepreneurs who are technicians in what they do, it's very difficult for them to put the toolbox down. It's very difficult for them to walk away from the cold face and trust someone else to come in. And so one of the things that, you know, that we teach people is scale equals freedom. And the only way you're going to get free from your business is through scale. Absolutely. And scale is about becoming a great leader, creating an incredible culture that becomes magnetic to attract the right talent and retain the right talent so that you can essentially have people that may not be just as good as you and certain roles and maybe better than you in certain roles but you can now actually step back away from the business and actually be working above the business so you're actually working on the forest you're not working on the trees absolutely and so for me in that context that, you know, that that's where i'm referring to how important is it and at what stage we'll start with how important how important is it for for an owner at some point to go okay I, i'm not aspiring for a title because as sure. you say, they're hollow. Totally. You know, it's just something you can, anyone can put anything on a fucking business card. But it's the psychology, it's the the practicality of how do I get myself to that point where I'm actually run, working on the business and what working in the business. Yeah, and that is a really good question because at those transitional points, it's going to be based on the size of the business at any given point. Yeah. So, so as a founder and a, a you know CEO of a company of one. It's very easy. You've got to get in and do everything. These days, it's easy to outsource. You're, you're the CEO, yeah. you're the accountant, yeah. you're the bookkeeper, that, that, you're the right, salesperson. Yeah. And, and look, if you're smart, you'll outsource various bits of it because these days it's very cheap and accessible, right? Yeah. To do to do into into all sorts of different um, countries. But I think the um, the thing about growing is most people like to hire in their own image, and so when they start bringing people on, they like to bring on people like themselves, mm. which is sort of you know almost the opposite of what you want to do because you want to bring people on who you don't have the skills the same as them, right? You want people who are going to compliment you and fill your gaps and bring something new to the table and you have to work out how to manage that. And that's really where it starts because for a leader, whether you're in you know, a multi-billion dollar business or whether you're in um, uh, an entrepreneurial venture that has five people, you've got to make sure that everyone understands what they're doing, they know their role, you let them, you let them carry out their role and they have clarity around what you expect from them. And so as CEO of you know, a major business, I always said that my main function was to set the tone, the pace, and the standard for the organization. That's what I did, yep. right? And, and, and it's no different if you're running a small entrepreneurial venture. You've got to set the tone, the pace, and the standard. And they say it's you know, a truism and a cliche, hire great people and get out of their way. Okay, well, that, that's sort of fine, but you can't just hire good people and expect they'll know what to do. Yep. You've still got to be the leader that says, here's my very clear expectations around how you behave, what you do, what you focus on, and what things we're trying to achieve, and then I'll support you to achieve those. So one of the things I've observed in a fast growth environment is, you know, I'll sit down with someone who's growing very quickly or trying to grow very quickly, and uh, one of the greatest challenges I hear consistently from people is, oh, talent. It's so hard to get good talent. Uh, you know, oh, no, I've got this problem with this talent. And, I, and, you know, I often say to people, which is quoted by a guy called Jocko Willink. I don't know if you've heard of Jocko oh, Willink. I, I listened to that episode you did with him. It was an absolute cracker. He is cracker. a fucking beast of a man. He is. He really is. But he says there's no bad teams, there's only bad leaders. Absolutely. And so what's interesting is, you know, when we sit down with business owners and they start telling the symptoms of their issues, um, you know, it's very, it becomes very obvious from the external that, okay, the problem isn't actually your team. The problem's actually you. So, you know, you, you, like you use the moniker of you, you're, the, you're the CEO, CEO, I guess, in many ways, but you really are a leadership specialist. Like, that's right. That's yeah. your core. That's your mastery. That's your, that's your genius. So from your perspective, so for people who are listening here who are perhaps trying to scale out, perhaps trying to grow, but they go, oh, fuck, you know, I've got problems with talent, I've got problems with the team, I've got problems with systems and you know, trying to extract the most performance. What are some of the symptoms that you've identified that would help people create a much higher level of responsibility around, okay, maybe the problem's me. So my question is, what are the symptoms of bad leadership and how do they show up in an organization? Oh, let me count the ways. Um, so <laughs> yeah, we, we could do the whole fucking podcast. So let's, on this. we we yeah. totally could. Let's just start with lack of self awareness, right? So, oh, beautiful. So, so let's just yeah. start there because yep. I think the self awareness piece is just so critical in growing as a leader. Mm. So so the leader you see in me today is completely different from the leader five years ago or ten years ago or twenty years ago. Completely different because I've had um, a real bent to learn. I've got this insatiable curiosity. I want to keep learning. I want to keep trying stuff. And when I find something I'm not good at, I'm a little bit dysfunctional, Kerwin. I throw myself into it. So, you know, back when I was first trying to have difficult conversations with people, when I was a very young project manager in the IT industry, I was so bad at it. Like you can't imagine anyone being worse than I was because I was arrogant 
and it was all about me. Mm. And I would sit there and I would be demonstrating how freaking smart I was and telling them the way the world was going to work and if they didn't do it, I'd step in and do it for them because I could. And that's probably the worst brand of leadership you can have. But I realised that I was bad at it, fortunately, because I still had this modicum of self-awareness. Yep. And so it all starts there because once you've got that self-awareness, you can actually see, oh, shit, I was really bad at that. Then you can do something about improving it. Without that, game over. Which almost leads in, I think, to a, another really important symptom of bad leadership, which is um, a, a lack of ability to identify when the ego is in play mm. or not being able to check the ego at the door. Is that something that you would agree with and you see as a correlation between people who have struggle to lead? Yes. Um, because they try and take that dominant role. They try and take that position of, well, I'm the authority, I'm the boss. How do you see ego showing up in unhealthy ways from a leadership perspective that cause some of these dysfunctions? Yeah, in, in all sorts of ways. And I think ego is a, is a very, very large subject area. And sometimes the ego is driven just by fear. Mm. I'm afraid I'm going to get found out. Now the, Imposter syndrome. The, well, absolutely. But, but sometimes it's actually warranted. Now, I was sort of lucky through my career path because I was going into businesses and I jumped across a lot of industries. And so I was going to situations where I had no expertise in the actual industry itself. And I had to learn that. But I couldn't walk in there and say at CS Energy, right, I've been in the energy industry for 30 years. I know how to do this. Step back and watch me. I walked in there and said, this is actually my first job in the energy industry, mm. and it happens to be as chief executive of a multi-billion dollar company. So I'm going to need some really good guys around me who know this industry back to front, and I'm going to listen to you guys, and I'm going to learn from you, and I'm going to take that on board, and I'm going to use the skills that I have, because I'm obviously here for a reason. The board thought I was going to do a job, and I'm going to take those skills, and I'm going to make this place better. But unless you have that um, fallibility, the, uh, the excellence over perfection mentality, which just says... We're not going to get this right all the time. Let's just keep moving forward. Let's make good decisions. Let's make them quickly. Let's keep moving forward. And I think one of the biggest um, ego problems is the not wanting to listen. Mm. And that's that's a massive, massive problem. I see it all the time. And most of it is fear and um, personal uh, insecurity, I think, that drives that not wanting to listen. Because you've got to be pretty open and you've got to be pretty robust and confident in yourself to be able to say, hey, guys, I haven't got a clue about this space. I'm going to need you to help me out. Yeah, right. As their boss. Yeah. So I know you, um, your specialist is creating high-performance teams. Where, where do you start when it comes to developing a high-performance team? You, know, you hear people like Richard Branson who say, look, I don't hire people for skills. I hire them for their attitude, and then I train them for the skills. When it comes to your philosophy of being able to build a high-performance team, where does it start? Does it start in the recruitment process? Does it start in the development, the career pathway development process? If you're if you're going into an organisation right now, there's a team of whether there's three people, thirty people, or three hundred people, and you're looking to assess, identify, and develop high performance in that team. Where do you start? Okay, so let's let's just start by um, circling back very quickly to to Jocko, who said that you know there's no such thing as a bad team. There's just bad leaders. Yep. And I think when he says that, the way I interpret it and the way I sort of um, uh, match that up and join the dots to my experience is that a bad leader won't do the hard work to build a great team. And by the hard work, that starts with putting the right individuals in place. Now, there are some people who aren't the right individuals. And I think when I talk about this, I talk more from the point of view of a leader who has leaders below them. So it's a multi-layer thing. When you're in a large organization, you're leading other leaders. You can't leave bad leaders in place. They're poison. It's cancer for your organization. And so you've got to be prepared to get them up or out quickly. They've got to be up or out. Now, most leaders aren't prepared to do that. They will make a thousand rationalizations as to why someone's okay and they should be left in place. Do you think it's the hard work or do you think it's that primal internal wiring of the human being not to want to put themselves in a position where they're going to cause a level of rejection on either side? Oh, com completely. But yeah. that's, that's why it's hard work. Yeah. Okay. Right? Because you, you're, you're actually doing something that's so counterintuitive yes. to your primordial drives, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. to get over that takes effort, it takes work, yeah. it takes self-awareness, it takes a whole bunch of things that a lot of people just aren't prepared to do, like anything else in life. Yeah, right. right? There's, there's a price to pay for excellence and success and mastery, and most people aren't prepared to pay it. And that's why you end up with, with the leadership sort of structures and capability we have in companies. I'm curious to know, a little bit of a slight side note before we keep going down this tangent. Do you think a high turnover rate is a bad thing? Or do you think it's context dependent? Uh, it's context. I'm glad you came to that because I was going to say it depends. Yeah. Right? Um, 
so at CS Energy, we had various turnover rates in different parts of the business. Yep. There, were, there were certain parts of the business where I would have loved to see a higher turnover rate. Mm. I think the distinction is that you've got to look at desirable and undesirable turnover. Yes. If you've got your good people leaving, you're yep. in the shit, right? Yep. They're leaving for a reason. There's something desperately wrong. If you've got your really poor people staying with bad attitudes, bad value sets and bad behaviour, then you're not doing that right either. And so it all depends on the context. Yeah, I totally. love that. Totally. Fucking, that's great. Because one of the things we talk about in our culture here, you know, um, because we do have a reasonable turnover rate. It's better than it's been. At the, if it wasn't for the sales department, it would be a lot lower. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you know all about that. Totally. Um, but I often describe our culture as like Cinderella's shoe, you know, because we are a legitimate high performance company. Yeah. Uh, and for a lot of people, they hear that and they say, like, oh, my God, I'd love to work in a high performance environment. And I've identified that there's there's three types of wannabe Cinderella's. There's Cinderella number one who goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that shoe's going to fit me. Just let me try it on. And they get in here and they put the shoe on. They go, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, it looks so good. Oh, look, I'll just put up with the discomfort. But then after a while, they go, fuck, you know what? This shoe just doesn't fit. Yeah. And they don't take responsibility that their foot is too big. They go, this fucking shoe, this shoe is the problem. Damn the shoe, this shoe is shit. I can't believe I even, you know. And then they ultimately on some level deselect or self-select. And then I've identified Cinderella number two is they come in and they go, holy shit, you know, these guys are really high performers and I'm not. But then they go, okay, the shoe doesn't fit right now but I want to work out how it can fit. And they look around the room and rather than blaming the shoe, they start looking around the room going, okay, Role model, role model, role model, mentor, mentor, mentor. I want to be just like these people. And then they aspire. And then Cinderella number three is they come in here and they put the shoe on. They go, ha, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. But what I'm curious to know from you is in situations, because again, you're, wor- you, you're working at scale. Because how big was CS Energy? How many teams? Well, see, it didn't. It wasn't a large workforce, right? right? So very, very big asset intensive industry, but only gotcha. about 500 permanent staff. Okay. So it's quite small. I've run much bigger divisions in different companies. S- still, but 500 people for, you know, most of our audience are going to go, fuck, that's a, you know, he's probably, well, I thought he was going to say five people. <laughs> well, 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 put it this way, I can't put my hands on spanners out on power stations, yep. right? So you've got to let people do their jobs, right? Absolutely. There's a lot, lot of layers there. But what I'm curious to know is, how do you, because, you know, Jim Collins always talks about getting the right people on the bus, but once you've got the right people on the bus, you've got to get them in the right seat. Okay. But when you realize that you've got the wrong people on the bus or the wrong people in the wrong seat, or there's just not a fit and they need to get off the bus, what's your methodology? What's your psychology around how do you get the wrong people off the bus? How do you let people go? Well, I think it's got to be a process that starts with the leadership dialogue. Yep. Right? So the very, very first thing you have to do is make it clear what your expectations are. So when I talk about setting the tone, the pace and the standard, right, it starts right up at the company's purpose. Why are we here? What are we trying to achieve? Rolls through strategy. Because we have this purpose, here's the strategy we have to achieve it because strategy is just basically a combination of two questions. Is the market worth winning in is question one. Yep. Can we win is question two, right? So you work out whether the market's worth winning in. You work out that you can win against your competitors and then you put the strategy together. And then after that, it falls down to the operational plans, the execution of what are we doing day to day? So people have got to have that clarity of purpose right through to the clarity of what I do. And if they can see the link between, here's what I do when I come into my job each day, here's how I work, and I can see that I'm making a difference and I'm having impact. Now, setting that up is the very first thing in the environment of a potentially successful organisation. Beyond that, each individual chooses how they behave and perform when they come in every day. And if people aren't meeting the standards, which you have to make very, very clear, and at CS Energy we had a very structured performance standard uh, set up which basically said here are the values of the organization we expect you to observe here's the code of conduct this is entry level stuff so this is a hurdle that you've got to get over here's what we expect you to do in your job in terms of adding value across these six performance dimensions and here are your annual kpis and then we underpinned all of that with a development plan at the back end that said if you're doing this right here's what you're going to work on in the next 12 months to achieve your next goal and so we had a very structured process for that That gives people a lot of clarity around Mm. what you want. And then it's about having the continual conversations around how are you going, how's the delivery on this project, are you having any issues, where are your your hotspots, where are your problems, and being able to just have that dialogue because I think too many people manage by email these days, just that human interaction of how are you going. And when you see someone falling behind, you're on it quickly and you don't let it turn into a massive problem straight away, but sometimes the problem's going to be unrecoverable. So you've got to be very diligent but in a caring sort of way. So, you know, I'm trying to help you, but dude, you don't want to be helped. Like, what's going on here? And then that goes through its own process where very quickly you can say, this person's not going to reach the performance bar I'm setting. 
and I love them, they're a great person, but they can't be here. I'm going to have to free them up to be successful in another organisation somewhere else, hopefully with one of our competitors. (laughs) So to narrow in on this, because honestly this is where I believe that most people struggle, is go, shit, this person's not a fit. I've tried to resuscitate for the last two months, two years. I've got to let them go. I'll do it tomorrow. Because of that discomfort, how do you have a process to make it easier to let people go. Absolutely, absolutely. To make it easier, and I think not just to let them go because that's the most extreme example, yeah. but just to deliver that difficult feedback that says you're not hitting the performance yeah. bar we're setting or you're not behaving the right way. So so there's a psychology for doing that. So one of the things that I um, am very, very strong on is how do you actually get your head around it? The skill's going to come, right? It's all about the will. How do you actually overcome that primordial urge that says I don't want to actually put myself in this situation mm. so that you can competently sit down and do the respect to the other person of having a a competent conversation with them. And so it starts with the psychology. So the first thing is you've got to realise you've got a duty of care Mm. as a leader. Like you've got a duty of care to these people and and you've got to fulfil that duty of care because you're putting them at risk and the organisation if you don't actually lead them properly um, to things like... um, uh, what's the other thing that is... I, I, look, I've got a whole podcast episode on this, episode six of No Bullshit Leadership. <laughs> covers covers this in detail. Yeah, right. Um, but some of the other things around the psychology of feedback are I talk to so many leaders who, across their career, they can get to 40, 50, 60 years old, have never been given feedback. Something that could have completely turned their career around. Wow. And no one's ever sat down with them and said, hey, listen, Mary, the way you're behaving is not right. If you want to be successful in an organisational context, particularly here with our values, here's the way you need to behave. And I'm going to hold you to account for that because if you can't behave that way, you can't be here. right? And having those sorts of conversations, it's like a pie in the face for some people. They just mm. aren't, aren't expecting it. They've never been told. Ironically, as people get further and further through their careers, what sometimes happens is that they'll say, I've, I've, I've got... 40 years experience in this business and no one's ever told me that it must be you you Johnny come lately CEO who's just turned up in this company last year yeah and so and so you get that which is sort of sad because it's it puts them in a place of denial and you look at them and you're just going you could be so much more you could have had such a better life such a better career made so much more impact if someone just had the guts to sit down with you and put their own feelings aside and tell you what they were seeing yeah right Reducing the prob- probability of having to let people go, it, to me, starts in the process of recruitment. Absolutely. Um, bad hires, very expensive. I can't remember the latest data, but I, I remember reading somewhere in Australia, like the average bad hire costs somewhere between forty and eighty thousand dollars for a, for a business. I'm not even sure if that's oh, correct. At, at the low end. At the low at end. The very low end. If right. you're hiring senior people, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars there you to go. replace them. Yeah. How do you decrease the probability of making a bad hire? Because a lot of people talk about the importance of, you know, you've got to know your purpose, your mission, all, all, your, all these values and, and these types of softer things. But how do you go, okay, if I make a wrong decision here, this is going to potentially cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. And at scale, when you've got, you know, an executive or a leadership team that could be in the dozens of people, what do you do to reduce the probability of making a bad hire? Mm, that's, that's a great question. And of course, in large corporations, it's a lot easier because you've got resources that you can throw at this stuff. Um, I find the hiring process still highly, highly um, uh, unpredictable, yep. particularly the interview process. And then when you look at referees and reference checkings and, and those things that people it's put out. It's a fucking no, minefield. Well, well, no one puts a, a reference check on their resume unless they know they're going to say something good about them. Yep. And so you find that that's all conspired to fulfill our confirmation bias. By the time you get to reference checking, it's a case of, well, look, you know, um, I want to hire this person. They've done really well at interview. I really like them. I'm going to call these referees and make sure that they're still the right person. So it's a confirmation bias around the fact that you've already got the right person. What I started doing, particularly at CS Energy, was um, a very, very rigorous set of tests that were administered to shortlisted candidates, so maybe two or three of the top ones you'd put through it. And what that was was a full suite of four hours of testing of all the um, aptitude tests, verbal, numerical, and abstract reasoning, yeah, right. critical thinking skills. Yep emotional intelligence, so a very serious emotional intelligence about whether you could recognise, understand, manage emotions and so forth, and then the personality stuff. And the psychologist that was doing that for me uh, in Queensland, fantastic woman, Frances Avenal, uh, was able to produce a report that basically integrated all of this stuff and said, here's this person, here's, here's 
what drives them. Here's how they're likely to behave in your context. Here's how you should manage them if you decide to hire them. And if there are any red flags, you know, she would quite happily say to me, Marty, don't do it. And, and I learned over the years to listen to her because she was generally right. This, this testing was very, very thorough and the way she integrated the results was fantastic. And so that really de-risked it for me. Yep. But did I make great highs? No. No, I still made a few shockers. You know what I mean? And Because um, some people are really freaking good at the interview process. Ab- absolutely. They're professionals almost. Absolutely. And you look at everyone's resume, they all have a cracking set of achievements, great track record. The best way to de-risk, apart from the testing, which I found super useful, is to actually know someone who's worked with them closely. If you have someone mm. who you respect, who you know is good, referral. who's actually had some sort of contact with them, it's that quiet phone call off the record. Yep. You know, I'm thinking of hiring such and such. Just tell me yes or no. And I've had that happen to me where I've had a candidate who's looking fantastic, got through all the testing, got through everything else, and I've rung a mate of mine and just gone... You know, you know this person worked the same organisation at the same time, and he's gone, mate. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it, Marty. So, and I've listened to that. Right. The other thing, um, when we talk about intuition, is you've got to trust your gut. Mm. When you see someone who is interviewing brilliantly, who's got all the answers, who tests well, if there's something in your gut that says, I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something here I'm not really sure about, I've learned to listen to that over the years. And I listen to that a lot more. Now, I'm not quite David Brent from The Office. Now, David Brent, I don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is a cracker. I get compared to David well, Brent all look, the time. This, so. this, this, this is a cracker because I remember him uh, once seeking out a role and he yep. got a stack of, interview, uh, stack of uh, resumes. And he cut the stack in half and he dropped half of them in the bin. And someone said to him, why did you do that? He said, because I refuse to hire an unlucky person. <laughs> I like that. You talk about the, the six dimensions of um, performance or the six performance dimensions. Yes. Uh, is that, that that's a part of your, your some of your core concepts, I imagine? It, it is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually seven. Okay, um, seven. The, the first one being deliver value, right? It's, is this different to the seven pillars of leadership? Seven pillars of leadership. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Seven, seven pillars of leadership is really it. So it's all about creating value for your organization. And right. you, know, you have a lot of organizations that are in different industries that say, oh, that doesn't apply to us. Well, well no, it does. It's the only reason you're there is to create value. So if you're a school, for example, and, and you're running a charitable organisation or you're a, you're a hospital you know, with surgery, your whole purpose is to create value. And the thing for you is to work out what value is in your context. Yep. So in your organisation, in your industry, at this point in time, what is it that represents value? Because that's what you've got to get after. And you know, they call it work for a reason. You don't go to work so that you can actually just socialise and drink coffee and all love each other. Do you hear that, right? Timmy? You got. To <laughs> I'm just kidding, Timmy. <laughs> you got to. You got to get. You, you know, at the end of the day, you have got to get results. And yep. so the whole thing is, how do you get results for your organisation by becoming a better leader and unlocking that latent value of the people you have working for you? Because it's probably the most untapped source of value in an organisation. Like anyone can repair a balance sheet. Anyone can do an M and A transaction. Anyone can run a cost out program. But can you really unlock the value that's there in your people? Mm. So people often say that the number one goal of a great leader is to create more leaders. In your perspective, what is the number one priority? Is it to add more value, create more value? To create value, yeah. And, and you do that through a range of ways. So, for example, creating a good leadership pipeline below you yep. is essential in creating value because then it's sustainable. And that's so, the scale. That's yeah, where to, scale well, comes from. Totally, totally. And you, yeah. don't want to, you don't want to be the guy who goes into an organization and says, look at me, I'm a hero, Yeah. right? Because you leave, if that falls apart, you exactly. haven't done your job. Yeah. And so at CS Energy, the chairman there, Jim Sawley, put in a great succession plan. The guy who's now the chief executive, Andrew Bills, is a fantastic guy who's going to take that business to the next level. Yeah. So I did my job. Right? I turned the business around. I got it to where it is, but it's got further to go. And he'll take it there where I couldn't because he's going to come in with a different approach, a different skill set, a different set of experiences, and he'll make a difference. Yeah, right? Right. And that's what you want. You don't, you don't want to be the, the CEO that everyone goes, I wish Marty was still here. You want to be the sort of CEO that says, gee, he did a great job and now we're going on further forward. How do you deal with codependent leaders? Now, what I mean by that, I'll correct some context here just so I'm really clear. Leaders who, by virtue of their ability to develop value, like it when the company or the organization becomes dependent on them. 
and they see their value is in the dependent and they start to go, well, shit, hang on. If they don't, if I actually duplicate myself, they're not going to need me. And if they don't need me, then, you know, I could get fired. And as a result, that codependent environment creates massive key person risk and can actually in some cases be the very thing that either brings a company down or creates massive bottlenecks to growth. How do you deal yeah. with codependent leadership? That, that's, a, that's a cracking example and cracking point because when it comes to technical knowledge, uh, company knowledge and industry knowledge, that's an important ingredient of being successful. But you're exactly right. People who actually know a lot, and CS Energy was exactly like this when I walked into it. It was a knowing culture, not a learning culture. Mm. So all the power was based in what people knew. So the people who knew the most hoarded it, not necessarily intentionally or maliciously, but just because naturally, I'm the font of all wisdom. I don't want it documented. I can't put it in a, a systematic way that other people are going to be able to access it because my value is in being the expert. Mm. And so understanding how to manage that, and I think uh, the trick for any leader who goes into a, a company like that is to understand the balance between having those core skills and knowledge that are really important to how your business functions, but bringing in different mindsets. So the one thing that CS Energy completely lacked was commercial acumen. So I started bringing in leaders with basic commercial skills, not from the energy sector, but from mining or from transportation or from somewhere else. And they would be able to bring a commercial overlay to unlock some of that knowledge. But these, these people who had all the knowledge base, they weren't the most important people in the room. They were still important, but no one is indispensable. No one's indispensable. You can't take it too far though. Like I, mm. I was never indispensable as the CEO. You know? And my point was, I need to make myself redundant as quickly as I can. I need to build a leadership team underneath me that's good enough to keep this company running no matter what no matter the circumstances, whether I'm here or not. Because if I do that, I've just locked myself into a job for life. I don't want to do that. I've got, I've got bigger fish to fry. I've got better things to do. And you'll never get promoted as long as you're absolutely critical to the job you're in. Mm. So, you know. Jocko says, uh, no one man is more important than the mission. Yeah. Um, but I hear this all the time from business owners going, look, I've got this person that's you know, toxic or not a fit culturally for whatever reason, but you know, they're my number one salesperson. They're bringing in the most revenue. And and I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. If I let this person go, you know, we could lose half of our revenue or we could lose half of our team. But at the same time, I feel like it's not my business. It's theirs. They've got so much control. How do you deal with a situation like that? Is it mainly the psychology of going, look, trust me, if you let them go, everything will be all right. Or do you have a little bit more of a, you know, a methodology around how do you transition in that situation to reduce the risk in the process of letting someone like that go? Yeah. And, and the... The risk reductions are a very important thing. In a large business, it's much easier because you've got many more options. You've yeah. got the, the knowledge and the capability spread across many more people in many, many different divisions of your business. Much, much easier to handle. But in that, in that context, and it's always been a thing for businesses, the example of the guy who's the incredible rainmaker, who brings in business out the front, who's a complete tool, and everyone hates and doesn't subscribe to the company values, doesn't play with others in the sandpit very well, basically a terrible person to work with but because they're bringing the top line in they get given too much latitude and too much uh, concession for what they do they're allowed to run and that know? turns often into entitlement which that, becomes absolutely. abused yeah absolutely and and when a weak leader doesn't deal with that sort of behavior it grows right so so the leader is seen as weak so other good people in the organization look at that leader and go weak as piss you know obviously they're not going to do anything about it the person who's behaving badly is going to get emboldened and behave even worse, untouchable, you know, protected species and so forth, and they're going to get worse. You can't have that stuff in your company. It'll kill your company. Mm. The dollars might be there today, but how many good people are you going to piss off and either demotivate or lose because they see you're not dealing with this problem child? So it's trickier in a, in a smaller organisation, particularly when they're, they're a rainmaker. Yeah. Very, very tricky. But you just can't afford to do it. You've got to bite the bullet. Have you noticed that rainmakers, salespeople – um, who are really good at what they do, oftentimes they are a little bit of an outlier, culturally speaking. Yeah, I think, um, and look, I don't uh, know a lot about the psychology of top salespeople. I think it's probably for someone else to comment on. But from my experience, what I've seen is that people like that realize the unique value they bring. Yeah, They realize their uniqueness and they realize how far ahead of the pack they are because we all know how many poor salespeople are out there. Yeah. And so once they get that, that gives them an enormous amount of confidence and as the word you mentioned before, Kuhn, which is ego. Mm. And the ego creeps in and it's game over. And I think 
you know, Jocko's right. No, no one person's bigger than the mission. Because it's to me one of the things I've observed. It's a really, it's a, it's a really interesting area to manage from a leadership perspective, and it's the area that me personally that I give the greatest latitude to. Because one of the things that I'm aware of, in order to be a crack salesperson, there needs to be a little bit of ego there because there needs to be that little Completely. bit of bravado. There needs to be that little bit of front. Um, but if left unchecked, it can become, you know, one of the greatest issues that you've got in the business in itself. Um, and they also need to be a little bit aggressive. They need to have a little bit of edge to them because in order for them to, you know, to close the deals at the levels that they do, oftentimes they've got that. Um, so yeah, it's still one that I think a lot of people are working up. You said the number one pillar was value. What's the number two pillar? Is uh, handle conflict. Right. right. So having so, the tough so conversation. That, that conflict version. Yeah. And I, th- I think that mantra of respect before popularity is just so important. Mm. And respect before popularity is what every leader has to embrace. Because look, I knew as chief executive of CS Energy, every day when I walked into that business, at least 5% of the people hated me for no apparent reason. <laughs> like my haircut, my time, yep. my time, didn't matter. Yep. For no apparent reason. Now, there were a bunch more there that probably hated me with quite good reason. But you just got to know that as a leader, it comes with a territory. So the leaders who just want to be liked by everyone, it stops everything they try and do. They can't negotiate properly. They struggle with making decisions because they don't want to you know, hurt people's feelings. That conflict aversion sub-optimizes everything. And so unless you can get over that, you will always struggle as a leader. You won't be effective as a leader and you'll hate your job. Mm. Like it's not fun if you can't get over that. So you just got to get used to the fact that not everyone's going to like me and that's okay because actually it's life. Yeah. So why would it be any different work? Yeah, understand. Number three, pillar number three. Number three is build resilience. Yeah, right. So resilience is uh, an incredibly important thing to have. And I think uh, some of the research over the last probably 20 years in particular on resilience has uncovered this concept of AQ, adversity quotient. And I like to think of uh, a, a, a successful executive career as being a combination of three things, which we think of like the three legs of a stool that hold it up. If you're, you're missing one leg of a three-legged stool, you're in the shit. Yep. Uh, and so those three three legs are IQ, which yep. is your basic smarts. And as they say, you know, you're born with an IQ, you don't change that. But you, know, you can do a lot, I found over the years, to improve your apparent IQ through knowledge, through experience, through wisdom, and through tapping into the capability of other people. Then you've got your EQ, which is the uh, emotional intelligence, which is all important to a leader. And I think most of the stuff that we do is to develop EQ. That's that's the most ground you're going to gain as a leader because everyone's different. And then adversity quotient AQ is all about your resilience. How uh, well can you tolerate the inevitable knocks and disappointments and setbacks and challenges that you're going to run into across the course of your career. Mm. And so those three things make a real difference. Now, you see people who don't have high resilience. And as they say, anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. You don't find out what someone's made of until you put them under extreme pressure. So I've seen leaders who just yell and scream and shoot the messenger. Something happens they don't like, they are exploding. Mm. And they'll throw chairs and they'll do all sorts of stuff because they can't handle the pressure. I've seen others who go into fetal position. Who, who don't know what to do, they hide, they, 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 they roll up, up in a ball, yep. they freeze, the organisation below them freezes. I see some who can't make decisions at all uh, once they get into this environment. Uh, so, so not being able to handle uh, adversity and not being resilient really cools a career. For me, uh, I aspire to what we call grace under pressure. And grace under pressure is it doesn't matter what's going on, you've got to remain in control, calm, rational, centered, talking a little bit slower than everyone else, keeping your voice a little bit lower than everyone else, and giving your people the signal that it's all okay. Mm. So so those sorts of things make a really big difference in leadership in the heat of the moment. How do you develop resilience in someone that perhaps recognizes that they don't have it because every time something gets difficult, they either throw a chair, rock into the fetal position, or like lose the ability to think coherently? Forbes, I think it was Forbes magazine in 1992 did a study of the Fortune 500 companies and the top 5% of CEOs over the last 100 or 80 years or something. And they identified that the one of the X factors was that those CEOs had a background in either military, martial arts, or some level of high-level high competitive sports. Right. Meaning that they had been put into situations where they had to break through and you know become comfortable with suffering. 
And it's interesting, the US government has spent millions upon millions and millions of dollars in the Navy SEALs program because they, you know, it costs about a million dollars to take an, you know, someone from a recruit in Navy SEALs to get to the end of year one. By the end of year three, they've spent like you know, four or five million dollars just to develop them as an individual. Wow. So it's, it's yeah. a fuck ton of money, right? And so I remember <clears throat> reading some research that once upon their, their success rate is 80% burnout. 80% don't make it through BUDS and, and BUDS is where they have Hell Week on the last week and before that's the, the training program for SQT which is the SEAL qualification training. So BUDS is basically what weeds them out before they actually give them the heavy types of training. And 80% of people wouldn't, wouldn't actually succeed in BUDS. And so they're like, fuck man, we're spending so much money bringing all these people in to have 80% of them go out the back door before they even get through the end. So they did all the psychometric and the psychological and the physiological and the biological profiling. Um, and they're like, okay, now we have a bit of an idea. They applied the model, still 80% of people would fall out. And after all the extensive research, they identified that there was only one key ingredient that determined the 80% from the 20%. And that was grit, which is also known as resilience. Mm. And, you know, when I, I, I questioned, you know, Jocko and other Navy SEALs that I've spoken about it, they say, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it, it, the grit is one thing, it's, but it's the ability to be able to suffer and still keep going. Absolutely. So for someone who's like, oh, fuck, I've never, I've never been a martial artist. I was never in the military. I've never been in competitive sports. In fact, every time I go to the gym, by the time I get to the third rep, I want to put the bar down. Do you have any kind of you know hints or tips for someone who goes, shit, I actually need to develop resilience. How do I develop resilience? Yep. Uh, and of course, I do have some tips for how to do it. But ultimately, what it boils down to is exactly that. You build muscle in the gym that the resistance provides in the form of weights that you lift against. And that's what creates muscle. Buying a gym membership does nothing for you. Mm. Being in a leadership title and position does nothing for you. It's about willingly doing the work to actually build the muscle, right? Resilience is exactly the same. Unless you willingly put yourself into adversity, learn how to handle it, and initially you're going to need a bunch of support and a bunch of guidance and a bunch of other stuff from the people around you. But ultimately, you're going to get better at that. No, no matter what you do, it'll strengthen up your resilience. And one day you wake up and you'll go, nothing phases me. Nothing phases me. It doesn't matter what it is. I can stay calm in any situation I can be rational, and I can lead my people through it. More importantly, I can, I can help my people to come through that. Yep. And when you're modeling that, it seems to catch on by osmosis. There's a lot of stuff that, that actually does in leadership. And you find the people below you start to become a lot more calm and rational as well. You know, oh, if the CEO's not panicking, I don't need to panic either. And I even would say explicitly sometimes, just relax, guys. I'll tell you when to panic. <laughs> no, you don't need to yet. Right? We got this under control. I, I trust you guys to get this sorted. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I'm a big, I'm a big advocate of um, horsemanship. A big advocate of um, a canine psychology um, as a part of learning human psychology because we're all mammals at the end of the day under that banner anyway. And one of the things that I've learned when it comes to working with horses or working with dogs or especially working with children is in times of uncertainty the pack look for the person who's solid yeah and they look for, and and then and they look for okay and by the person they're looking to the pack leader and like you say the pack leader will go i'll tell you when to panic but the challenge for most pack leaders is they're fucking panicked all the time and so as a result <laughs> <laughs> it flows through the organization yeah and i'm sure you'd agree stress is a bit of an issue when it comes to performance you know not just as a psychological barrier not just as a you know, immunological, there's so many negative consequences of stress. You know, we're developing, we're learning how to develop resilience, but are there any other things that you have learned to do in order to become calm under pressure? Because I say to, you know, I say this to people, like imagine treating your, leadership to me is parenting 101. Because, you know, if you've got uh, a child that's not doing what you want, most parents, maybe in the old school, would yell at the child, curse the child, and maybe even smack them. Sure. And I say to my people, can you imagine doing that to a fucking employee? <laughs> <laughs> if they're not doing what you want, you ridicule them, you shame them, and then you pick them up by one arm and smack them. You'd never in a million years do that, right? But it's the same context, right? How we create healthy kids is the same way we create healthy employees is by developing you know, a strong connection, a strong relationship based on trust. And the only way we can develop high levels of trust is when they know that in with the situations that are you know, going to hit the fan, they're not going to be humiliated. They're not going to be shamed. But my question really is, how do you teach a leader to remain calm, you know, when it's not 28 degrees, you know, 
you know, 15 knots and we've got dolphins off the side. We've got Cyclone fucking Katrina coming in from the left, you know. The, we don't know if we're uh, you know, up from our down and the shit's hitting the fan. How do you teach someone to become calm in a cyclone? Okay, so there's a couple of, there's a couple of very important things. The first thing is having perspective. And for most people, and I know there are you know, organisations and industries that um, aren't like this, but for most people, no one's dying on the table. You're not doing cardiothoracic surgery. You're not landing space shuttles, right? So get it into perspective. Mm. The only problem that you really need to worry about is a problem that comes to someone's health and well-being and safety, right? So in an industrial business, for me, keeping my people safe every day, that's number one. That's number one. I've got to provide the safest culture, the safest processes and systems that I possibly can so that when people walk onto our sites and in our organisation, I know they're okay. That's number one. Anything beyond that, like, you know, get in perspective, guys. How big a deal is it going to be in a week or a month or a year? Like, think through that. Consciously sit down and say, how big a deal is this? Okay, so there's been an adverse um, article in the Fin Review today about a company that says we're gaming the market. What do we do with that? Okay, well, it's, it's in black and white now. People are reading. There's nothing we can do about that. So what are we going to do? Do we respond? How do we respond? Where do we respond? Do we let it go through to the keeper? Like, then you just... Does have, anyone even read the Korea Mail anymore? I'm just I, kidding. I, I, I said, I, said I, I, I hope I said the Fin Review because I tell you what, I... I, I, I wasn't no, the Fin Yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't disparage any of the press. No, unless, they're all amazing. We unless, love them. Unless they, they're doing great <laughs> Unless they write some more shit about me. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, anyhow, I'm trying to stay off the fucking radar. Right <laughs> <laughs> but, there's, but there's this whole thing about, about perspective, right? And yep. that's, that's one part of it. But there's also something that I like, which is a, um, a, a, an explicit exercise you can do, which is basically separating what you control, what you influence, and then the things you have absolutely no influence over, which I like to call the cold hard facts. Now, this comes back to the the old Stephen Covey work from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People where he talks about circle of concern and circle Circle of influence. influence, Right, okay, so it's it's sort of an adaption of that. But, um, But basically what it says is, okay, you can only control certain things. You can control yourself. That's it. That's the only thing you control. So what you think, what you say, how you feel, like you get to control that. Outside of that, it's all up for grabs. So then move to the cold, hard facts. What's the stuff that we have absolutely no possibility of changing? It's either something that's historical, it's already happened, or something that's completely out of our control. Okay, recognise it, but let it go. You're not going to do anything about that. All of a sudden, your problem's just been scoped down. And then you've got a few things you might be able to influence. We'll just get after those. Mm. Right? So that, that, that process of turning it into an intellectual exercise where you can actually map out the problem and map out how it affects you is fantastic. And then, of course, after that, there's a series of questions about, you know, what does it mean to my business? What's it mean to me? Does it does it affect my leadership brand? Does it affect our long-term earnings? Blah, blah, blah. So you can ask yourself a whole range of questions that then help you to do this thing of putting it into perspective. So as a, as a technique for handling any sort of adversity that comes at you, it's a fantastic technique because it just helps you to rationally sit down and take the fear out of it and take that initial lump in the throat we get when when something bad happens that we didn't expect and deal with it yeah nice number four number four work at level Oof, okay. work, at, work at the right level like do your job yeah right do your job right that's it and uh, a mistake a lot of people make and it's you know it's sort of a natural mistake so let's think about someone who's working in a team as um an accountant right they've spent say, five years studying at university, they've got their degree, they've gone into an organisation, they've got, you know, two, three, four years' experience, and all of a sudden, they get promoted to a role where now they have to worry about other people. And so at that point in time, they've just gone from being an expert in finance and an expert accountant to being a novice leader, something completely new. Yeah, right. Now, even though they've just studied for five years and spent all this time and energy, or probably a lot longer if you think about the stuff they did in high school... Uh, they put all this time and energy into becoming an accountant. All of a sudden now, they're in a space where they don't know what they're doing. And so they're naturally going to revert to what they do know. And they're going to revert to where they're comfortable. And they're going to revert to where they see that they have value. And there's perceived value in their skills and qualifications as an accountant. There's no perceived value as a leader at that point. Mm. And that's okay in your first leadership role because you can keep your hands on most of those levers. And in all likelihood, the reason you got promoted is because you're better than the guys around you. And so you can step in and correct their work and help them with their work. But if you do that, you're not doing your job, you're doing their job. So 
we get these people that and are you're no longer a leader, you're now a technician again. Yeah, and you're a micromanager. Now, mm. you can get away with that at the first promotion. Try that as an executive general manager. That is not going to work. When you've got a 1,000 people underneath you and all of a sudden you're going, gee, I don't like the way John Smith did this down four levels below me because I know how to do that job because that's where I came from. You simply can't step in on that stuff. Every role has a unique purpose. It has a unique time horizon. And it has a unique set of deliverables that you've got to come up with. And the skill is actually knowing what to do at each level as you go up. Most mm, people work, work one level, level or more below where, yep. they, where they should be. Yep. And it sub-optimizes the organization. Because if I step in and do your job for you, Kerwin, what does it tell you? It says, well, fuck, what do I care? Marty's doing it. Yep. Like Marty's got the answers. Why do, why do I care? And so, and we've now bottlenecked performance because we've now got two quarterbacks. Completely. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you know, you, you all of a sudden, you're disempowered, you're disengaged. Okay, you want to do my job for me? Go at it. And so it just completely suboptimizes your organization. So keeping people at the right level yeah, is a like core that. skill for a leader. And as you go up, obviously, the, the higher you go up, the broader your perspective has to be. Yeah. So we go back to our accountant example. When you're, when you're a team leader of a team of accounts, it's pretty easy, right? You understand all the content. Try that as a CEO. Because you have to understand finance, marketing, economics, competitive strategy, media and public relations. Like you've got to have this broad range of skills that cover the whole of the business. And if you haven't on the way up gradually increased your breadth of knowledge and your breadth of, of purview over the organization, then you're going to get to the top and it's going to be like a mushroom cloud. Mm. I'm finance, 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 CFO. All of a sudden I'm in the CFO, CEO gig and I know nothing about this other yeah. stuff. I can't even have an intelligent conversation with an operational leader because I'm just the finance guy. You know, it's funny you said before about self-awareness because I think self-awareness and consciousness, they're two, you know, the two sides of the same coin. Mm. And, you know, when we look at the, 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 the data on neurology, the human brain processes about 16 trillion bits of information every one second, but the average bear is only conscious about 2,000 bits of information. And so one of my philosophies in business is it's a spiritual game and not necessarily in the religious context, but in the context of how do we slowly grow our consciousness so we go from processing 2,000 bits of information to 2,500, to 3,000, to 6,000. And to me, enlightenment in business is exactly what you're talking about there, where you slowly go up through the business and you gradually train yourself and condition yourself because most people get overwhelmed. When they start to process more information, they get overwhelmed. They go, oh, fuck, this is bad. So consciousness is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. I'd rather be ignorant because it's blissful. How do you work with someone to expand their consciousness but at the same time trying to balance the overwhelm that can creep in when people try to do too much? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we were talking about stress before. Yep. And, and I'm a massive believer in the positive um, outcomes of stress. Yes. To a so point. Important. Right? To, to a, a point. point. Right? Yep. So, so you'd be familiar with Yerkes Dobson Law, which says that um, uh, performance increases with stress up to a point and then it basically falls off a cliff. Diminishing return. But basically where you want to be is the intersection between anxiety and boredom. Right? The state of flow comes when you're stretching yourself right to the edge of your capacity but you're not so far that you actually lose control mm. and, and anxiety and fear and all the other stuff overcomes your body both you know, uh, physiologically in terms of the chemicals that are released and the way you're thinking, right? Yep. That, that just completely destroys you. So it's finding that point effectively, which is so important. And now I've forgotten your question. What did you actually ask? Me? I that, don't know, but that's that, a fucking great okay. answer. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that stress is just so important. What's well, the consciousness? Do it. yeah. it's oh, like, so how do, you, how do you teach people to breathe and out on the yeah, way Yeah, how do you teach people so, to become more conscious? So, so that, that whole thing about um, describing to them what their job is. So when I say, uh, as my job as a leader was to set the tone, the pace and the standard, that standard includes what I expect from you at each level in terms of how you're broadening your perspective. And so if you actually turn up on an executive team that works for me, you've got two jobs, Right. Your first job is your area of discipline. So I might have a head of marketing. I might have a head of operations. I might have a CFO. And so you've got a role to play there. But guess what? You're also an executive of this business. So I expect you to understand all the other portfolios. I expect you to be able to engage in conversation on all the other things that are going on in the business intelligently. And I need you to bring something to the table there. You've got to bring your unique perspective because that's how we're going to make a great team. Mm. And so I used to say to my guys, um, mostly individually, but occasionally as a group, if you don't bring something to the table, if you think the same thing that I do, then at least one of us is redundant. And it's probably not me. <laughs> one of the things, um, you know, I've, I've had the great opportunity to be able to do some training, weapons training with the Navy SEALs and weapons training with the Ukrainian forces, uh, special forces. 
And one of the things that I observed is exactly that. They go, you know, you've got to be conscious of the point of diminishing return, especially when you're dealing with weapons because you don't want to yeah. accidentally shoot your mate in the back when you're doing a kill house uh, drill. And so what I, what I observed them would do, especially, and this is, this is in some cases also with high-level operators who were moving into the special forces, is I'd spend, you know, you know, day one of a 14-day uh, weapons training camp, it would be, you know, they'd be training for three hours a day. First two or three days, it'd be three hours a day. Uh, and then it would be dry fire for the rest of the day. And then by the end of the 14th day, they were doing, you know, five, six, seven hours. And what I observed is they were slowly building up competency through layering um, uh, executable actions on top of each other. So the first one would be, you know, just learning how to draw your, your, your firearm. And then before, you know, it was learning how to draw your firearm, then rack it. And then learning how to draw your firearm, rack it, and then clear it. And then bit by bit, they would like build up, build up, build up to the point of diminishing return went from three hours before you become so fatigued that you couldn't operate properly to a point where it was like six or seven hours and they could oh. operate seamlessly. Wow. So I'm curious to know from your perspective is when you are – initiating someone into the higher level of business is that a matter of a little bit at a time a little bit at a time or is it more of a okay you're, you're now in this role here's everything you got to deal with mushroom cloud and all yeah and uh, great question great example the um the whole thing i think about this Kerwin, is that you have to give people a little bit of the time on the way through yeah but there's also something to be said for the deep end mm. and and you need to test people sometimes by dropping them in the deep end just seeing what they do yeah you know you've got to be there to support them so if if they're drowning you don't throw a brick at them you throw them a life preserver yeah but you've still got to be able to test people to say i wonder if they're going to rise to this challenge yeah right and and that's good for you and for them because mm. because those that do rise to the challenge and you talk about the the 20 percent that make it through buds well they're not paying the money for that program to get 100% of the people through. That that money is targeted so they can produce that high quality, high performing 20% that are going to go on to become Navy SEALs. Mm. And it's the same in business, right? You test people out, you give them challenges, you see a little bit of potential and you try and feed that and you see if you can bring them through to the next level. Some people do, some people don't. But you give them that opportunity, you support them and see where you end up. Number five. Number five, master ambiguity. Ooh. So ambiguity in today's world is ever increasing, as we know. Yep. It feels like it's getting harder and more complex as time goes on. And I think being able to handle that as a leader, that's what you basically get paid to do. That's what you get the dizzy dollars for. As you go up an organisation, you get larger and larger decisions to make in environments that are more and more complex and ambiguous with less and less direct control over the resources you're commanding. It's completely paradoxical. And so being able to do that comfortably is around both a mindset and a bunch of techniques. So as a leader, one of the big things about ambiguity is just that unwillingness to make a decision. Mm. So forcing yourself to make decisions in an ambiguous environment is really important. Uh, there are times when you have no choice but to make decisions in an ambiguous environment because events are pressing. So Deepwater Horizon disaster, Dreamworld disaster, you know, those sorts of things where the play's coming at you and you have no choice but to decide quickly. The thing that I think is important for an organisation and for a leader is to work out how to do that when you don't have external events pushing you. So how do I actually keep my decision-making tempo going well? How do I actually take clarity out of all this ambiguity? Because my job as a CEO is to translate all of that stuff that's happening in the energy market for my people so that they know what they have to do today. Mm. That's it. That's what I have to do. And so it doesn't matter that the federal government's been dicking around and hasn't had a policy for 10 years. It doesn't matter that our owners are thinking of selling our assets. It doesn't matter what, yeah, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. My job is so that you know when you come into work, here's what you've got to do. So I've got to find a way to do that. Yeah, right. And so a little bit of intrigue here. If someone wanted to find out the other two p points of the, of the seven pillars of, of leadership, where would they go to find that information out? That would be the website, www.yourceomentor.com. Yep. Um, so that's where you'll find our podcast, No Bullshit Leadership. And I also... I really love it. That's, <laughs> that's great. Good. Yeah, Apple didn't love it so much. They made us put a little exclamation mark <laughs> yeah. instead of the eye. So yeah, they're not keen on profanity. Well, I think we have to bleed everything I say, basically, don't we? Yeah, pretty much. Poor Timmy. He, so, he works very hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, but it's there. And also the seven pillars of leadership are under... Uh, obviously our Leadership Beyond the Theory program, yep. which we're kicking off in March. And that's really where I unlock some of these things we're talking about because you can learn this stuff. Yep. Okay, some bits are harder to learn than others, 
but mostly you can learn it. Yeah, that's right? fantastic. If you've got the will, you can learn it. So what's next for you, Marty? What, what, what's next on the horizon? Well, I think for me, the, the, the you've whole- You've had quite an illustrious career. Like you really yeah. basically just check out now, but you're not. No. <laughs> and when I say check well, out, like, we're, you know, some people love, like the idea of retirement. To me, that's like just accelerated death. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm a long way from retirement. So, so I think, um, you know, I had, a, I had a really good career to date. And now I've decided I want to do more. So I've been put on this planet to do what I'm doing now. That's it. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. And, um, you know, your interview with Bill Bennett around intuition, I mean, that, that knowing for what it is you're here to do and how you're going to do it and just that belief that you have in the universal forces. I think it's yeah, just right. so important, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, But, you know, I've, I've also got a very strong anchor in the practical world, if there is such a thing. Um, uh, you'd appreciate this, given that your um, father was an economist and your mother was a clairvoyant. I believe is that right? <laughs> You've done um, your the, homework, the, yeah. uh, the the J.K. Galbraith quote, the uh, the famous Canadian economist who said, uh, "The only purpose of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable." <laughs> but he, was, he wasn't he wasn't a big fan of wasn't a big fan of economic forecasting. But look, I've had a great career, and I think everything that I've done in my career has just prepared me to hit the starting line. Now that's it, right? I've I've done thirty years of leadership to uncover the things that I've uncovered, now to a point where I can say, look, you know, there's, there's a bunch of people out there, they've read the books, they've learnt the words, they can talk to you sensibly about leadership. I've actually done it and I know what's gonna make a difference to mm. you. And of course my style's not gonna be for everyone because it is a no bullshit style, it's very direct. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, you know, I wanna make leadership better and I wanna make it better the world over. So Emma and I are on an absolute mission to do that. And that's, that's you know, I'm invigorated by it. Mate. I'm excited by yeah, it and, you know, tell. and, and it's, it's me, right? So uh, biggest mistake that people make in leadership? Biggest mistake, um, making it all about themselves and not listening to those around them, yep. right? Believing your own bullshit is just one of those things that I see all the time, you know? And, and as you go through your career further and further, this is why I'm not targeting CEOs with this business, right? They've already had a bunch of success. Like, what are you gonna tell me? I'm a CEO. Yep. Uh, and I think it's, it's that hubris that brings companies down. It's that hubris that suboptimizes the business and it's the hubris that impacts people so that when they come into work, they don't enjoy what they do because it's all about another person. It's all about someone else who's self-seeking. Uh, being able to put that aside is critical. Yeah, I think once upon a time, it was fair to say most people looked at leadership as a very uh, rough and tough tumble kind of, you know, do as I say, not so much as I oh, do. Yeah. There's been a massive evolution and disruption in the in the way, you know, people view leadership. Covey was, you know, one of the pioneers in that space when it came to the softer skills. But what I'm curious to know is um, when it comes to humility, when it comes to vulnerability, um, which is what I'm discovering, you know, especially with the, new, the young breed of, you know, uh, millennial employees that are coming through, they're looking for relativity. They're looking for some point of relationship that they can go, I can relate to that. But in the days gone by, most CEOs have kind of kept everything close to their chest. They leave their problems at home. They expect everyone to leave their problems at home as well. One of the things that I've discovered is if you expect your team to leave their problems at home, it's going to be hard to get the best out of them because if you can't help them work on their own issues, that's going to be something that becomes a bottleneck. But in order to get and extract, you know, in some cases, what is very intimate and private information out of people, you've got to be willing to have a level of humility and vulnerability. Are you seeing this as being a pattern across the board or is this just something that is quite fringe that is still frowned upon at the corporate level um, or is it something that's being integrated across the board? Is it being integrated? I think there's a much greater awareness of it. Right. I'm not sure how many old dogs are going to learn the new tricks yeah, right. would be my spin on it, right? Do you think now, they're going to die out and the new breed will come oh, through? Eventually, yeah. just just through generational change in business yeah. because you know the, the baby boomers are getting old, right? Yeah. Uh, and there's less of them now in the senior ranks. And so things will change over time. Look, I'm not a massive fan of the conversation about leadership attributes. And, yeah. and let me just tell you why, Kerwin, because there's this sort of, um, there's this thing that, uh, everyone interprets a word differently. So when we talk about humility, mm. your idea mm. about that could be completely yep. different to mine. I hear you. Or integrity, right? And, and you know, my idea of integrity, because that was one of the four values I set up at CS Energy, I'd walk around the organisation, I'm going, you are 180 degrees from where I am on this. You just have no idea what I'm talking about when I mention the word integrity. But that's okay, because everyone has their, their frame of reference, their life experiences and so forth. I think it's much more useful to talk about leadership competencies, which does cut over attributes at some point. Um, you know, you can talk about things like humility. You can talk about also in that same context, financial skills or judgment or 
confidence and so forth. Vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, when you boil that all down, everyone has an absolutely unique leadership style. It is absolutely unique. So, you know, you read an article on LinkedIn that says, um, you know, we need leaders who are more humble. So we're going to hire for humility. Well, no, don't do that. You also need leaders who are confident and capable and have a level of robustness and resilience. Not all humble leaders have that. Mm. And then you also need leaders who have the core skills of business, right? Because unless they have commercial skills and communication skills and everything else, they could be as humble as they like, but guess what? You're going nowhere. Mm. And so it's just basically finding that blend because everyone has their individual and unique. It's like a fingerprint, their unique leadership identity and style. And it's developing that in a way that's constructive because at the end of the day, it's all about human connection and human relationship. Mm. And you're exactly right. You cannot leave people's um, personal issues out of the office. You can't because if they're having trouble at home, it'll affect their work performance. And the trick at being a great leader is to be able to look at your people and know them well enough to say, hey, look, Joe's normally a fantastic worker who produces really well. He's been off the boil for about a month. I wonder what's going on for Joe. Mm. And to be able to call Joe in and say, hey, mate, look, you know, I'm no psychologist and I don't want to pry. You don't need to tell me if you don't want to, but I've just noticed you're off the boil a bit. You know, you're normally so good in this area. Your performance over the last month or two has been a little bit under under par for you. Is there anything going on I can help you with? You know, but it's that human connection to be able to tap into that. You don't want to, you don't want to pry into people's lives. You certainly don't want to be telling your, your workforce on Friday afternoon drinks how shitty your divorce was or anything like that. But there's a human connection element that underpins everything else you do. But do you think it's not about prying but about creating a safe environment where people are willing to share. Because what's interesting about this organization is people go, fuck, this is like group therapy. Because sometimes <laughs> we all sit around and we're just putting our stuff out there because it, people finally, and, you know, we have dealt with addiction. We have dealt with, you know, suicide. We have dealt with mental illness. We have dealt with, you know, relationships, break, depression, anxiety, or everything. And as I said, kind of hinted towards before, most people like would be like, fuck, no, you leave that shit at the door. Yeah. But what I've discovered is the more the more we focus on creating, and to me, you know, and again, I'm just going to probably um, impose a little bit of my own psychology or my own belief system here. One of the things that I've identified as being a great leader is the same thing as being a great parent, which is the same thing as being a great horse, horseman or, or, or dogman, which is if the animal or the human doesn't feel safe, they ain't going to connect. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Trust and, and respect. Yeah, but most people, again, it's like, it's counterintuitive because it's like, well, fuck, I thought people need to be a little bit afraid of me. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a balance. Well, oh, it, it It's a very is. fine balance. It completely is. Look, and I completely agree with what you said, Ku, and the, the interesting thing for me is you've got to get that, the balance for me is with the friendly but not friends thing, right? Yeah. So you've got to be personally connected, but you don't want to get too far the other way, right? Yeah. If, if you're close friends with the people who work for you, everything becomes tougher. Mm. And they'll take liberties because they know your friends. Yep. And you'll find it harder to do the hard work of leadership that you may need to do from time to time. Got it. So it's friendly, not friends, but it's having that really close human connection and caring. Like if, if your people know that you care about them and if they trust you, there is nothing you can't say to them. That's mm. it. So as a leader, all the fear goes away because you go, I know I've developed trust. I know I've developed a relationship. I have the opportunity and the capability and the will to sit down with this person and have a conversation like that with them about something that may not be related to their work mm. or only loosely related to their work. But the the sorts of things you're talking about bringing into the workplace, like talking about depression, talking about suicide, like this is crucial. It used to be just swept under the carpet and big boys don't cry. And particularly you look at the, the organization I ran with, you know, power stations out in remote Queensland locations. You know, this is not a place where I thought the workforce would ever get onto this. Yet when we ran a few programs out there on suicide prevention, so we had the um, some things you might have heard of, are you okay, mm. you know, mates in construction, like that sort of stuff where you're just caring for your mates around mm. you and looking for those signs of, you know, something's not quite right with Fred today, you know, I wonder if he's okay, I'm, I might just ask him. Made a massive difference because the suicide rates in young blue-collar workers in, you know, remote locations are incredibly high. You know, much higher than the, than the um, average in the population. So, you know, dealing with that's important. And that's an obligation that I had as the CEO. It wasn't, mm. it wasn't something that was nice to do. It was an obligation I had was to address those issues as best I could. Marty, thank you so much. Clearly, this is a, f a subject that I'm very passionate about. We've gone like almost fucking half an hour over time. This has been an incredible podcast. This is the first of many, I have a feeling, of conversations that you and I are going to have. Great. Uh, where can people find out more about Marty Moore? 
Uh, just go to the website, www.yourceomentor.com, and everything's there. And especially those last two points of the seven pillars of leadership, because I can tell Absolutely, you right now, yeah. you're going to want to know what those last two points are. <laughs> Marty Moore, thank you very much. Leadership Unplugged, you're a great man. Thank you for coming in. Thanks very much, Kuro, and really enjoyed it. Cheers. Thank you, mate. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say. And your reviews make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media, at Kerwin Ray.